Hi all, welcome to the session Kick Off Your Ruby Selenium Automation with Ruby Rider by Augustine Gottlieb Pekino. So without further delay, over to you, Augustine. Thank you so much, Ritu. And thank you everyone for joining this workshop. So we're going to be doing some live coding. We're going to be talking about how to implement Ruby and Selenium and also what is Ruby Raider if you don't know it. Um, this is my website, as you can see it here in case you want to afterwards read further and check a little bit the documentation on the projects. So let's jump into the introduction and let's check the agenda that we have. Now we already have the quick introduction. So we're gonna look into how we can set up a Selenium Ruby project with Ruby Raider. So let's jump directly to it. If you have your terminal open, what you can do is you can install Ruby Rider by doing gem install Ruby Rider. I'm also going to be running the commands on my own terminal. So now I'm just going to switch into my terminal and I'm going to run the command that hopefully you should be running on your local machine. We're going to see that it starts to load in the gem. In case that you are not familiarized with what a gem is, a gem is just a package, a library that we use in Ruby to handle our dependencies. Now let's go back to the presentation. Please let me know if anybody has any issues on the chat. And after we got the gem installed, let's start using it, right? So Ruby Raider gives you the possibility to set up different types of automation projects. We are going to use Selenium and RSpec in this session today, but just to let you know, you can also select Appium-based projects, you can select water-based projects, you can select sparkling water-based projects, which is a framework I have built following a water syntactic sugar for mobile automation. So let's go back into the terminal and let's generate a framework together. So let's do Raider new, and let's name it Selenium Conf, since we are at the conference, actually 2024, just to remind the edition of the Selenium conference. We select the framework we want for automation, in this case, Selenium. We select our spec right now. We could add an extra layer of visual automation with Apply tools. In this case, we're gonna just keep it simple. So I will select no. And we could also add accessibility checks with Axe, which is a tool specifically for accessibility testing. But again, we're going to keep it simple. So I'm going to say no. And you're going to see the options that you have chosen. And you can see all the files that are being generated and created right now. Let's just quickly check before I open my IDE. And we can see that we have the folder here, Selenium Conf 2024. I hope everybody can follow at the same pace. And again, all the questions are more than welcome. And now that we have our framework generated, we can jump in and just run our first test. What you can see here is one of the example tests that Raider generates for you. Why you have this example test? It's just you can have inspiration, right? And you can also see all the pages and reusable helpers that Raider provides to you out of the box. So I'm just going to open my IDE, right? I'm just going to go into my screen here and just switch it up. There we go. And now I'm just going to open and let's find it on my desktop. Selenium conference, here we have it. Let's trust the project. And now, we can see that we have opened the Raider project. We have the docs here that you can read and you can see all the different combinations and requirements in case you're running a mobile or a visual automation project. And you can also see all the different commands that comes with Raider. So let's look at the first test, right? As we were seeing in the presentation, and we can see here that this is a basic login test, okay? The idea of this test is we're gonna go to the login page of 
our website. We have a test website that is saved on the configuration, automationstore.com. It's a really nice website if you want to practice your automation skills. It's essentially a test e-commerce site. So what is going to happen is we are going to log in as a user with our password and username. And then we're going to validate if in the header we can see our username. A couple of things to point out if you have this open on your computer, you can see that we have a model factory. This is how we handle data in Redo. The idea here is that we have in our model folder our data, which is users.yaml in this case because we only need users. Right, So you can see my fake user for this test is loaded into this variable and then we can access it and as we will access any normal hash, right? So without further ado, let's just run our test. Hopefully the browser is gonna open in this screen, there we go. You can see that the test is running, we logged in. We have a second test that I'm just gonna write right now. The idea here is that we enter the wrong password so the header doesn't get updated. There we go. Perfect, the test also passed. So now I'm gonna go back into the presentation. Let's go back to full screen here. Perfect. There are two ways that you could run this test if you wanna run it from the terminal. You could use the classic rspec or Rider also provides you an utility command that is called Rider U for utility RAID. Why do I provide this command on Rider? As I mentioned before, we can create frameworks based on Cucumber, based on RSpec. Hopefully we're gonna add extra support for different frameworks. So if you don't want to remember how to run every single different type of framework, and for some reason you need to create several of them because let's say for example you work in different automation projects like i do right uh, or in your team you're trying to implement a different framework because you want to let's say run some bd tests with cucumber you might not want to remember exactly all the commands so raider offers a little bit of help in that sense so now I already did a little bit of a deep dive into the project structure, but let's look at everything that Rider provides you to make your automation simpler. So I'm gonna go back to my IDE. I usually use RubyMine. Again, if you're following from Visual Studio or any other IDE, that's perfectly fine. So let's close this and start from the top. We are gonna look into the workflows that Rider generates, right? Because Rider also comes with our CI CD prepare for GitHub actions. I'm gonna touch upon this at the end of the workshop. But besides that, we also have our Allure results folder. Rider uses Allure, which is a dashboard generation tool. I'm gonna show you afterwards how the dashboard looks. So the good thing is out of the box, you already have your CICD, you already have your reporting, so you are ready to go. You just need to start automating. The configuration folder, of course, includes all the configuration for our different browsers, right? And it also includes the base URL. It's important to notice that if you're gonna be working with mobile automation, and you want to use Rider, you're gonna have some extra configuration files for your different devices. But the basic configuration that probably you're gonna be using is a web one, which looks like this, both for RSpec and Cucumber based projects. Afterwards, we have a helpers folder. I really like to expose all of the helpers so you can tweak them and you can modify them as you please. The first and most interesting one is, let's just quickly fix the layout. The most interesting one I think is the driver helper. The driver helper provides you with everything you need to start your driver. 
Just to notice if you're using Watcher, right? Rider provides you with the browser helper, which will be the equivalent of the driver helper because Watcher uses uh, the browser in their framework. So what you can see here is that we are gonna have an attribute, a method that we can access named driver. And this is gonna become really useful in our spec helper. And when we are creating a driver, we are loading the configuration file. And then we're just parsing everything that is on that configuration file to create our browser, right? Um, here, the rest of the methods, I'm not gonna look deep into it because it's just mainly parsing options for a configuration, but the most important methods are the driver, which you can call from everywhere, and then the create driver. So let's look at where we are using our driver and how it works. In our spec helper module, we can see that we have all the configuration for our specs, and you can see that we're including by default the driver helper. Here, we configure before each test our driver. We maximize it out of the get-go. Of course, if you don't want to have it maximized, you could just remove this and you can just have the driver available for you, right? And we also have the Allure helper configuration here. Why do we need the Allure helper configure here? It's in order for Allure to start listening and creating the data that it needs to generate our dashboard. You can see after each test, we are gonna create on the Allure result folder an attachment that matches uh, the test that we just run. So we have screenshots available in our dashboard. I already explained models, right? The model factory is just really simple in the most basic form of the frameworks we can generate. It just loads the YAML file. That's pretty much it. And then we have our page objects implemented here at different levels. So something interesting that we use in Ruby Raider is the component idea. I particularly like to split my pages into different components. For example, the header will be an example of a reusable component that in our automation solution appears everywhere. So login page has a header, card page has a header, product details page also has a header. We can see here that the login page and also the account page inherits from the page object. Here we can have, we can see our basic methods. We have the attribute reader for the driver that we need at initialization. And then we can also see that we have a couple of useful methods, the full URL, which allow us to when we are on the page, we can just add the rest of the URL that we want. And then when we visit that particular page, we are gonna be able to just get directed into the page we want. Let's go back through the page. So what we also have is we have the 2S method. This is a really nice and helpful method if we just want to uh, have the name of our page parse in the way we want to parse it. So for example, here you can see that it's just adding a space and it's gonna be named login page. It's just a little bit of, what can I see? Pretifying a, how our pages can be read. And now if we look at the components, the components follow a little bit of a different structure. When we create a component, right? And this is the base component class. We have to pass the element that creates the component. And we're gonna look that in our test. And based on that, we are gonna be able to do component.txt because usually what we consider components in this framework are complex web elements, such as a full header that might have different menu options, might have dropdowns, as is in our case right now. So if we go to the login page, we can see that we start with our subject, which is account page that header that customer's name. So let's look at the header in the account page. 
we go back to page and we can see that what we have here is a header at the page level. We can pass, we can see here that we're passing the element as I was mentioning. And the reasoning why is at the page level is because our header component spans across all of our pages in our web solution. So if we go back, we can see how we are initializing the pages that we need. And we can see how we're using our component here. That was a little bit of a deep, deep dive into the folder structure. I also touch upon how we use the page object pattern here. Does anybody have any questions on the chat? Um, any doubts? Are you able to follow on your own computer so far? Augustine, I uh, don't see a question, so I guess everyone is following up okay. right now. Perfect. Good to know. So now I'm just going to jump back into the presentation and we're going to continue. Uh, the helpers that we're getting, as I mentioned, are Allure, Driver, and Spec Helper, right? I just did a, a deep dive into them, but now let's look at the Allure Helper. So let's go back into our IDE. And after we executed our test, let's just run the command that we need for Allure. So let's just go into our terminal. I just need to move a little bit here. Perfect. Because I cannot see it on my screen. Let me quickly move. Here we go. Perfect. And then let me just do Allure serve Allure results. This is how we generate our dashboard. So let's see what we get. Is generating a report. And we can see that we have a report from the last test I executed. I'm just going to move it here so you can see it, right? And we can see that it was the login with wrong credentials. And we have a screenshot out of the get go. The good thing about Allure and the reason why is the default choice in Raider is because there's a lot of support for different frameworks. There is a lot of support for CI CD tools, and it's pretty straightforward to just have it up and running. If you have never worked with, uh, with Allure before, it might look a little bit different if you start working with a Cucumber based project. Something important to have in mind is that Allure gives you different results in different colors for different tests. The thing that might confuse you a little bit when you start using Allure is the difference between failed and broken. Failed is when an assertion fails. So now I can just show you how a failed test looks. I'm going to close this window and I'm going to stop the server right there. And let's try to make one of our tests fails so we see how it looks on a show. Let's say that now instead of expecting this, I'm going to expect hello. Selenium. We run it again. Perfect, it's running. We're going to see that the expectation was not met. And now let's start our Allure serve results again. Perfect. Now I'm going to move the browser again. And as you can see, this is a failing test. So it's gonna show us what it failed, right? So we can see that the assertion failed and this is red and we can see at the exact point that it failed. But now let's say that we broke our test in a different way. So let me just go back into uh, the header. And now what I'm just gonna go here is, I'm gonna name it fake element. I'm, I'm going to execute our test again. So now, because it's not going to be able to find the element, right? It's going to throw us an error because it's raising an error when trying to find the element. It's going to consider that the test is broken. So now when we start Allure again, 
and I'm just gonna start the survey one more time. We can see that the result is yellow. Let me just quickly move the browser window here. And we can get the full stack trace of no such element, et cetera, et cetera. And we can go deeper into it if we want. I'm just gonna roll back here and just kill the server. Perfect. And this was a quick demo of how the Lior dashboard works. I can see there's a question in the chat, if I'm not wrong. Going great. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Mahesh. I appreciate it. Um, now we already talk about the page of the model and how do we use it. I just want to put emphasis on the components, right? And I'm going to open right now our solution. So I'm going to go back to my IDE and I'm going to put a breakpoint into, let's see, actually here, right? Because I just want to emphasize again the use of the header component. Perfect. So as you can see, in Raider with the structure that we have, we consider a component, an element that is really complex and can have different, uh, what can I say, sub elements into it, right? So if we look into the ID of the element that we're taking, let's just go for the header here and let's actually look where the header is being used, customer top menu, as an ID, and let's go back here, perfect. We can see that this particular header, right, has some menus, right? And we will argue also that this submenu itself will also become a component. And then we have different options and different submenus depending on the option, and we can get different redirections. The reason why I like to split things in components and add that to the page object pattern is because I have usually seen and I have experienced my own projects that pages like, let's say, the login page or the account page starts becoming just this type of super heavy classes that is really difficult to navigate and to go through. So by splitting things into components, we get the flexibility of reusing our code, knowing what we need to add. So for example, let's say that we want to add another method that says, um, let's check dev, uh, let me quickly check, uh, go to specials, shows us a random reason, right? We could add it here and we already are incorporating our header into all the pages that we need to, right? So we don't need to end up in this extra maintenance situation where we just have to remember, okay, I have this method here, where have I used the header, you know? So we already know we have our components there, everything related to that is there. And when we want to implement it, we can just add a method to pass our components. Something that I actually did not put emphasis on, but uh, is something that I like to do. I like to add a comment signifying what methods you are gonna find um, under those comments. So you can see that on pages, you can see what we call actions in Raider are actions that can be performed by the user. So a user can log in, for example, and elements that we tend to use them as private methods. You can see all of them under elements, of course, the same with components, right? Now I'm just gonna stop the debugger so we don't have that hanging out there. And I'm gonna go back into our presentation. Let me just quickly switch the window. And this is the deep dive that we just did into our page object model. The good thing is if you have any questions after this presentation or if there is anything that you weren't able to follow you can also go back into it. We have a, on the Raider project, 
a full wiki explaining several of these concepts. So you are feel, feel free to go there and just check any doubts that you have. Or you can also, of course, write on GitHub or uh, contact me. But now let's write our first test together, which this is actually the fun part, okay? So I have a little bit of a, a small challenge for you guys. One thing that I would like to do is, uh, let's just use the debugger again so I can show you the solution we're gonna be testing. I would like to be able to test, let me just log off here, continue and log in. I would like to be able to check the forgot your password a, a scenario, right? What we're gonna be doing here only is adding our login name, adding our email, and just pressing continue and expecting a result. So let's do it together. Again, this is a mock site, of course, so we might not trigger an email. And then I'm just gonna use my email address. Mm -hmm. Perfect, and we're gonna be expecting this success here. So, the good thing that we have on Raider is that pretty much from the examples, and of course, in this particular example, I know it's really similar, it's going to be easier for us just to do a lot of copy and paste, right? So first of all, we usually in Raider follow the format of having one spec per page, right? We have our forgot password page. so we are gonna create a new spec for it. So let's just do that right now. I'm just gonna copy and duplicate this. Forgot password page spec, perfect. I'm just gonna name this forgot password. The thing is, if we look at what we require here, right? it's really easy just to see the pattern that we have to follow. So instead of the login page, right? We just need the forgot password page. Perfect, we don't need this right now. Good. And then what we need is, we don't need right now the account page because that's not where we're gonna validate it, be validated. So we can remove this. And for now, this subject is not gonna be needed. I'm gonna keep it here so we we'll remember to use the subject. Now, what we're gonna do is, we don't need to log in. That's not our intention because in this scenario, we forgot our uh, password as it tends to happen to me. But we need to visit the forgot password page and we need to instantiate the forgot password page. So let's just name it forgot password page. There we go. Some Danish letters there. I need to get used to uh, use the American keyboard so I can avoid that. Um, and then let's change our context here. So let's say, Actually, we might not really need our context in this scenario. I'm just gonna remove the extra test we have here, right? And then let's just remove this context here to keep it simple. We just need to move this up here. So we have all the LEDs together and then our scenario will be that it can successfully recover the password, right? So what we're gonna be expecting is expect success message, let's call it that for now, to equal, and uh, let's see what the success me message says. So let's try it again. And let's just quickly inspect it. Alert success. 
let's just straight up copy the value and then we can see if that's looking right. Perfect. And now we know that the subject is gonna be our success message. Something that we also know is that the success message is gonna be part of actually the login page, right? So the forgot password page redirects us to the login page. So at the end of the day, we might still need the login page. So let's just add it here, require relative login, perfect. And then let's just copy this, login page, perfect. And this is gonna become our forgot password page, right? Something important and something I really like to do when I'm running tests, I'm just gonna remove, by the way, the double quotations here. So RuboCop doesn't complain, there we go. Uh, something I like to do is I like to start writing from my ten test perspective, not necessarily writing the pages and the components from the get-go. And I like to execute it and see it fail on purpose, right? So we're gonna see that the error that is probably gonna throw us is like it can load such file, which makes absolute sense, right? So what we do now is we go to pages and let's just create our page together. Rider also offers, and let me show you, Rider, there we go. It's gonna show us all of our commands. And Rider also offers a couple of extra generators and URL setup if you need. In this case, we do not, but it's just for you to know that it's available in case you need it. Now let's just clear this so we keep it simple and let's create a forgot password page. I just duplicated the login page just to uh, make it easier for us for your password. And now, do you remember that I talk about the URL here? We need to supply the right URL for the forgot password page. So let's go back and we need the subdomain here. So we have it here. And now we can easily navigate to the forgot password page. Let's go back to our test and let's rerun it and see what happens. Now we could find the page it visited, but of course we are missing several methods, right? So if we look at the complaint that is happening right now on the final local blah, blah, blah account page. So, Let's go here. Of course, we don't have an account page, right? And as we talked before, it's the login page that actually has the success message. So let's just do success message. But of course, we know we do not have this method on the login page. So we need to create it. Let's see it here and uh, let's say as an action to get the success message. So the success message. And what I will do is I will do find element. So I will go alert element dot text. The reason why I like to have my action separated from my elements is for usability purposes, because I might want to have a separate action that uses the same alert element for something else, right? So for example, to validate that uh, the alert is present. Augustine, yes. Just a reminder that we are left with 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. Thank yeah. you so much. I'm gonna go a little bit faster, guys. So you can, of course, write questions, but is just to wrap up the test. So now let's inspect our alert element. 
good. Let's just copy the class that we have here, just to make it easier. Let's give it a try with just the alert itself so we can use it in the future. And now what we are gonna be missing here is we are gonna be missing a way to input the value of our username and email. So what I will do is I will do forgot password page and let's call it, what can we call it? Recover password, right? And we need our username, but we also need our email. There we go. So now back to the password page. And actually our login method is already looking pretty much like the recover password method we want to create because recover password, we have to pass our username, we have to pass our email here. So I'm just gonna change this for the email field. And then the login button is actually gonna be the recover password button for now. Perfect. And now what we do is we should replace the name of our elements. And of course we need to inspect them to see if we have the right element. So let's quickly do that. I'm just gonna go back into here. We have the ID forgotten form login name. So we can easily replace it here. Perfect. Let's look at our email field and see forgotten form email. Perfect. So let's just quickly replace that. And now let's look at our continue button. Tadel continue. So let's just replace that here. Uh, perfect. Actually, I want to name this continue button. Now that I read it, I'm just gonna do this weekly so we have it. So now guys, let's execute our test again. And let's see where we get. Perfect. So the email provided was not found in our records. Let's see what email I provided the user YAML. Maybe I use a different user for the example. Interesting. I did not provide any email right now. So we could be validating another case afterwards, but let's just add the email in our user. And it's as simple as extending just with the email field here. Uh, let's give it a second round. Perfect. Now, the only thing that is missing actually is our success message is a little bit different, right? So we are expecting this, but we actually got the dash n with everything. So I'm just gonna quickly do this just to have the test green, and then we can do it in a more elegant way. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. There we go. Perfect, so let's run it again. And let's see if this time it reads as, at where, as we're expecting. Oh, it's at an extra dash. Perfect. So what I will normally do here is I will just remove what I do not need, but actually we can just add quotations here. And let's get another go. Perfect. And there we go. We have a test that is passing and it's green. So I hope you guys will follow that up. So these are the useful commands that you can use while you're writing the test, right? Uh, just to let you know, in the latest version of Raider, we have removed the OpenAI commands, but the rest are still there. 
And let's go back. Let's look quickly into our GitHub actions, right? So let's say that you write your second test. You want to have this on your CI CD pipeline, on your own repository. So now what you can just do is you can just upload your project to GitHub, right? And automatically you're gonna have the setup with the Ruby version that you need. It's gonna check your repository. It's gonna install your gems. It's gonna create an allure results directory, right? And what is interesting is it's also gonna create a GitHub pages site so you can deploy your all your results into this GitHub pages that you can share with the rest of your team or you can just a send if you need to show somebody your test, right? And what is always gonna run is, is always gonna be generating the all your report for GitHub pages. You need to remember to set the personal token here, right? So it can deploy for you. But besides that, is pretty much out of the box. That was really, really quick. And I can see we have two questions on the QA, Q and A. Let me just quickly jump back into the presentation. Uh, shall I read the questions for you, Augustin? Yes, please. Thank you so much. Yeah. So Mahesh has two questions. One is what strategies do you recommend for debugging and troubleshooting test failures in Ruby Raider project? That's a great question, Mahesh. Thank you. Uh, what I recommend mainly is if you're using your IDE to have access to your debugger, we don't have for now any specific extra uh, debugging capabilities that comes out of the box with Ruby Raider because I have noticed that a uh, People prefer to debug in different ways. As I show you, the way I usually debug is just using the debug gem that comes a, from a Ruby gems directly. But if you have any suggestions or any of you guys have any suggestions, you can go to the Ruby Raider project and you can create an issue or create a feature and we will look into it. The feedback that we have received from our users is that mainly they prefer to debug in their own way. And we have another question, right? Yeah. So how does Ruby Raider handle configuration management for different testing environments? That's a great question. So if we're talking about different web environments, what we could have is we could have three different base URLs, right? That we could switch, let's say, for example, between development, staging, and production. For more complex projects, it's really easy to add that into the configuration file. And just have, we also, I didn't look much into it right now. I didn't went deeper into it, but you can also go to the rake file that is created and you can add a different rake task. So you could pass, let's say different flags for your configuration, right? I hope that answered your question, but please guys, if you have any more questions or anything you want to know, because we have one minute left and I know we have to follow the schedule. Uh, right, Augustine. Yes. And thank you, Augustine, for sharing your experience with us today. Thank you so much. Have a nice day.